I'd like to introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Mark Papich. Dr. Papich is Professor of Clinical Pharmacology and Supervisor of the Clinical Pharmacology Laboratory in the College of Veterinary Medicine at North Carolina State University. He's a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Clinical Pharmacology and has served as president of the ACVCP. He's also a fellow of the American Academy of Veterinary Pharmacology and Therapeutics. In addition, he served as a member of the Veterinary Medicine Advisory Committee of the FDA. So join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Papich. Welcome. This is a topic that I get asked a lot um, about, you know, when with new generic drugs coming out, people always want to know, are they really the same? Or, you know, are they equivalent to the brand name drugs? Is it something that I can switch to? And so it's a good thing to discuss. We should ask the question, why would uh, veterinarians or their clients even consider generic drugs? And this is true, obviously, in human medicine as well. Uh, it's a big, a big part of human medicine. And the biggest thing is obviously cost. Uh, now, a lot of these statistics and things like this are taken from the human medicine side. We just don't, we don't have as much of this detail on, in veterinary medicine because, to be honest, we don't have very many generics in veterinary medicine to do a good comparison. But in, uh, on the, in human medicine, it's, the generic drugs are 80, 85 percent less, which when you consider all the medications in human medicine, that accounts for billions of dollars in savings. And what people want to know is, and pe the reason that people use them, is that they want to have some assurance that it is, it's equivalent, uh, equivalent in performance and quality is the brand name product. And with, if it is FDA, there is some of that, 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 there is that assurance. And they want an FDA approved product. Again, to give them some assurance of that. So, uh, people will switch and, you know, and, and it cost is obviously the big thing. But, you know, in human medicine, again, that's, we don't have the statistics in veterinary medicine because, as I said, there quite simply aren't that many as compared to human medicine. But eight out of ten drugs prescribed are generics in human medicine. Uh, so it is a, it's a huge, huge part of the market. But uh, so, so how are they approved? You know, what assurances are there? And it is all generic drugs must be approved by the FDA. And, uh, you know, there are some veterinary marketed drugs that have never been approved by FDA ever. A um, good example is thyroxin. There's no such thing as a generic thyroxin for veterinary medicine because the original has never been approved. So you see lots of very variation in a medication like that because there's nothing essentially to compare it to. But if it is truly a generic, a true generic has to have an FDA approval. And what we call, I don't, don't want to get into a lot of detail here on terminology and so forth, but they, a brand new drug, a new approved drug by a veterinary sponsor will have what they call an NADA number, a uh, new animal drug application number, and that's the NADA. But if it's a generic that is a version of the original drug, it has what they call an abbreviated NADA, and those numbers appear on the label. For example, now these are, di these are all carprofen. You can't probably see it on the label here, but all of them, the original, Remedil, would have an ANADA number, the generic forms, an ANADA number. So they, they do get FDA approved. They have to go through a process whereby they get approved and shown to be equivalent to the brand name product. If it's some, let's say, a compounded version, and I'm going to talk about compounding a little bit later, you can look on the label all you want. You'll never find either an NADA number or an ANAD number. It's those have never been approved. If it's a compounded product, those have never been approved by the FDA. So the concerns, though, and this, I get quite these questions. You probably, some of you probably heard these. When you're looking at a, considering a generic product, a generic uh, drug compared to the proprietary product, is it really equivalent? risk of its maybe poor stability or poor absorption? Is it going to be maybe a decreased or altered therapeutic response? Or perhaps could there be adverse effects that the brand name product doesn't have? And most, we can alleviate these concerns as if we can assure that there's bioequivalence. Um, sure, certainly there can be differences in things like excipients, and that's essentially the only difference. But otherwise, they're shown to be bioequivalent. And what I mean by that is it's shown to be absorbed at the same rate and extent, I'm talking about an oral product here, as the brand name. 
So all manufacturing, you know, again, if it's FDA approved, they have to go through, you know, testing to show that the manufacturing, packaging, testing sites, they have to pass the same quality control assurances as a brand name drug. The, many of the generic drugs, not all of them, and in veterinary medicine it is a little bit different than the human side, but according to the FDA, this does come from the FDA's website, according to the FDA, many of the generic drugs are actually made in the same manufacturing plants as the original brand name drug. In other words, the same company is making both versions of the drug. And that's actually quite common, especially on the human side. But the FDA requires uh, that they have the same active ingredient. That, ha that is, they have to show that they have the same chemical content, the same active ingredient strength, dosage form, and route of administration as the brand name drug. The, the, everything about it on the label has to be identical to the original brand name. Uh, the labeling indications, the dose, the frequency, indications, that has to be the same as the original product uh, in order to, if it is a truly an FDA-approved product. And they must prove that this, that is the same and, uh, bio, as we say, bioequivalent as the brand name drug. What do we mean by bioequivalence? And that, this is a term that people maybe haven't thought about or haven't considered the definition of. And there's actually three kinds of bioequivalence that we talk about, or equivalence. One is the chemical equivalence, and they have to show this. In other words, they have to show that it has the same chemical ingredient. They have to show that the tablet size, for example, has the same strength and potency within the standards that are specified. And these are usually according to USP standards, USP being the United States Pharmacopeia. And I've served on the USP Expert Committee for Veterinary Drugs for quite a few years now. And, those, and it's pr pretty tight specifications, uh, very tight. They have to meet specifications as, met, as dictated by USP. If it doesn't, they can't make the drug. And then there's what we call bioequivalence, the biologic equivalence. This is showing that the drug is absorbed the same. And I'll show you some examples of that. And then the third one is therapeutic equivalence. Now, this isn't always proven in a study. And the reason for that is that you assume that if it has the same strength and potency as uh, the original pr product, and you can show that it's, if it's an oral product, that it's absorbed the same rate and extent as the original product, then one must, one assumes that it's probably going to work the same. And this is the, what the assumption that's made. Now, every once in a while, there are products that you can't show that it's absorbed the same because they're not absorbed. A good example might be, let's say, an antiparasitic product that's uh, active only in the intestine because it's working on intestinal parasites or perhaps it's a topical product. Those drugs aren't absorbed systemically, and there's no real good measure of, uh, of the rate and extent of oral absorption. And so if a company is seeking approval for those types of drugs, you seek therapeutic equivalence. In other words, you show that it works the same. And that's, so that's a different criteria. But for most of the oral products, uh, most of the current ones that are uh, in a generic form, it's this bioequivalence as shown by the absorption that is done in a, what they usually refer to as a blood test. And blood test is simply getting a bunch of animals, or in the human case, a bunch of people, and it's quite large numbers, usually at a study minimum, minimum of about 20, 25 people or animals, but often it's more than that. And they compare them, compare two drugs in, in the same group of patients or group of test people or animals, compare them. And they are equivalent when the active ingredient exhibits the same rate and extent of absorption as the reference product. So in other words, if we had drug A being the reference product and drug B, you give them to the same group of, of test subjects and measure the blood profile and show that it's the absorbing at the same rate and extent. These probably would not end up not being equivalent because the peak isn't the same and the extent is shown by the AUC uh, we'd have to, you'd have to run it through all the tests and statistics, but it wouldn't be. Whereas a case like this, you know, where they match up almost identically, eh, there's a good likelihood that these might be bioequivalent because they're being, it's, one can show that it's being absorbed at the same rate and extent as the original innovator product. So what do they look at? Well, to measure the extent, that's used, using what we call the area under the curve. That is the total exposure. The same rate is measured by what we call the C-max or the peak. So you have to match the peak and you have to match the area under the curve. And so if we have two of them, you know, a reference in generic, what the guideline, and this is quite strict, says that, and I'm, this is what we call untransformed data. I won't 
talk about the statistics as much, but untransformed data, this rate and extent has to be within plus or minus 20 percent of the peak and the area under the curve. So if you're comparing one versus the other, they say it has to be within 20 percent. But a real key point here is that it isn't the, just the average value. It isn't just the average value that they look at. It's actually quite a bit more complicated than this. And the way that the, the test is done is you take the test drug, compare it to the reference drug, and it's, a, it's simply a, it's a ratio. But again, it's not simply a matter of just comparing an average, because if all you did was compare the average, you'd get a, it, it wouldn't be that hard to get a generic on the market, but it's much more difficult than that. What the companies have to follow is this is a very detailed bioequivalence guide, guidance that the FDA puts out, and companies have to follow this. If they're going to get a generic company, a, a generic product on the market, they have to follow the FDA gu guidance, which is quite specific and quite detailed, and the cr criteria, quite honestly, are difficult to meet. And so what they have to do, rather than just let's use the absolute average, they have to do what they call a confidence interval. So you take all your test subjects, measure the, the area under the curve and the peak concentration, and then they have to draw confidence intervals on all those subjects. And it's a 90% confidence interval, and it's the confidence interval that must be within plus or minus 20%, not the average. And I'll show you an example of that graphically in a minute. Uh, sometimes you, they transform the data logarithmically, and it's a little slightly different criteria on transform data. But if it's the absolute value, it's within this value. So what do I mean by this confidence interval? So we take drug A and drug B. As I said, it's not just simply that you measure the, you know, the average difference. What, what they do is, let's say we take, let, I'll, let's say this is the area under the curve, or the Cmax, either one. And you take your innovator drug, the original reference product, you have an average, certainly, but then there's confidence intervals. And these little lines on each side represent the confidence intervals, the 90% confidence intervals that, that, that account for all of the animals or people that were used in that study. And it can be quite wide, especially with quite variable drugs. And then you take your generic drug, do the same test, and so this would, the little box in the middle represents the average and then you have confidence intervals on each side. So with this product, you know, we have upper and lower confidence interval, and it has to, you have to do both, both ends of it. And because it is within the 80 to 125 percent, I'm using the, tr the transform data here, so it is a, it's 125 percent instead of 120 percent. And it looks wide, but when you have these confidence intervals, this actually would meet it. This actually would meet that criteria because it, was, it is within those bounds. But if we take another product, the average isn't that much different. This is the, another hypothetical example of a product called, where I'm calling B here. But, and on this end, on the lower end, it meets it. But just that little tiny bit up here, just that little bit over the edge, and it only has to do it by a very, as the generic companies full well realize, you can miss it by 1%. And it's so close. But if they don't meet it like it does here, this would be a failure. And because of the natural variation, uh, people often don't realize how variable data is in dogs, or for people that matter. If any of, any of us sitting here, if you take a pill today, and if we were to measure the oral absorption in you, and then compare it with next week, and that's how these studies are generally done in a crossover ma manner, you know what the variability is? It's 30 to 40 percent. Inter-individual variability is 30 to 40 percent, just naturally, in the same person or in the same dog. So when you do these kinds of studies, this variability just kills these people. <laughs> it's really, really hard for the generic companies to meet this criteria because of the tremendous variability. It's hard to show that one product is equivalent to itself because of the high variability in doing a crossover study. So this, this makes it a very, uh, uh, I've looked at data from generic companies and realized how hard it is to meet this criteria. So it's, it's a lot harder than people realize because of that. Uh, so if you were to only look at the average, uh, it would be pretty simple. But because of this other criteria, this other burden that's put on them, it's a lot harder than they realize. And this is, on the human side, there's been a lot of concern about whether or not, uh, you know, there should be a concern about generic products and how bioequivalent they are. 
Uh, this is, just came out recently, so I, I, read, it, I put it up here as a useful citation. One of the concerns cited in this paper that they were actually investigated was whether or not something occurs called generic drift. I don't know if you've ever heard that term before, but I'm not talking about genetic drift, generic drift. And generic drift says, well, okay, you know, we, we get this idea about the, you know, confidence intervals and how hard it is for a generic company to meet those criteria. But what about one comparing one generic to another? And the point they were making here is, okay, let's say we had this innovator drug, the original, you know, proprietary drug that they were compared to, and we look at generic drug A and draw the confidence intervals. But what, let's say our product fit here. You know, it was still within the confidence intervals, still within these bounds, but it was sort of at the lower end. And then we have generic drug B, another one, and it met the criteria as well as far as being compared to the innovator, beats, you know, within the bounds and draw, after drawing the confidence intervals. But it's, it fit like way out here. So they were both equivalent, but at different ends of the spectrum. So then if you were to compare one generic to the other generic, not to the innovator, but comparing one generic to the, another generic and substitute them, let's say we switch them in a patient. Because when you go to a pharmacy, you know, if you go there, fill a prescription one month, they might fill it with one generic. If you go come back a month later, they might fill it with another generic. So what is the switchability of those? So the idea here, the concern about what they call generic drift is that, okay, now with this one versus this one, this is a much wider interval now, and this, and this is actually greater than 20%. So this hypothetically has been raised as a concern. So they looked at this, and again, once again, there's not been this sort of a comparison on the veterinary side, but because of that concern, they reviewed 12 years of bioequivalence data from the, of this, these were applications for, for generic drugs. And they looked at over 2,000 bioequivalence study. And what they found is essentially that generic drift does not occur. They could not find any examples in it in all of these bioequivalence studies. And what they found is that it's so hard, it is so hard to meet bioequivalence criteria anyway, that almost always when you're comparing one to another, the ratio, when I'm talking about the ratio, that is with the AUC or the C-max, it's almost near unity, almost always near unity, almost always, in other words, when you compare the averages, almost 100%, and the differences are actually usually within about 10%, which is quite tight, which is, that's, that's very tight. And the reason that they give the, the reason that this occurs is that because of the variability, in order to get the generic on the market in the first place, it has to fall because of the, of the confidence intervals, the, the criteria that one has to meet. It is so hard to get that product approved in the first place. It has to be really close to the original innovator product. So this study, uh, without going into other details about it, essentially dispelled this idea of the generic drift pro uh, may, may occur when switching from one generic to another. But it does raise some questions about, you know, what we do in veterinary medicine. And I threw a couple of other things in here just to, you know, I'm trying to uh, give you some confidence in generic drugs, but also some of the problems we occur when we go a little bit too far. And one of them is that what happens when we take a, a human generic drug, not an approved veterinary drug, but a human generic drug, and put it in our animals. And that we do get some concerns once in a while. So when, what I hear of oh, this, you know, a generic is not going to work as well, it's a lot of times people are not referring to a, hu a veterinary generic as a human one. And a good example is this. This is a uh, product that I know many of you have probably considered using in your pets or in your patients. And this is generic Cipro. There's no such thing as an approved veterinary Cipro. It's a human product. But it's generic, and it's very inexpensive, as probably you know, um, extra label use is approved. It's not approved for dogs, but extra label use is approved by, it's allowed. But because of the availability of these cheap generic human formulations, a lot of veterinarians have been using this. Uh, these ta those tablets are, if you've ever looked, they're pennies a piece, literally. So we got to thinking about this and looking through the literature, found that in dogs and cats and people, it's absorbed actually quite well. The uh, absorption of Cipro in people is 70, 75 percent. In dogs, it's quite variable depending on what study you look at. And, and in cats, it's not very good at all. 
So we got to thinking about this. So a couple of years ago, we published this study. And what we did is we looked at, we gave the uh, Cipro IV and oral. So we had the two routes of administration. And it looks like the oral tablet was actually absorbed okay here, but consider that the dose actually was twice as big. So absorption wasn't that great, but the thing that really got our attention here was the variability. These high error bars showed that it was, uh, it was absorbed, but it was really variably absorbed. And the absorption was only about, oh, 58% with high variability. And that's, that's not nearly what it is in people, but the variability kind of got our attention. And we act, when we actually looked at our group of dogs about what accounted for this variability, we found that some dogs absorbed it actually okay, you know, 80-some percent. But other dogs in the group absorbed it pretty poorly, only about 30 percent. And we wondered, why does this occur? So what we actually did is we took the same set of dogs and instead of giving them a tablet, gave it as a solution. In other words, it was dissolved. Rather than an intact human generic tablet, we gave it in a dissolved form. And essentially what happened here was this poor absorption group, it corrected for that. And they all ended up up here with a good absorption. And now, actually, when we gave the oral solution, what we found is that oral absorption was very close to humans. It was closer to 70, 75 percent. So, so this really kind of puzzled us. Is what, so why is this so low and variable? We don't know for sure. We're gonna, there's some studies that we are following up on. And by the way, we've also now tested a lot of our clinical patients, uh, patients in our hospital that have been given Cipro. We've taken blood samples out of them and find that this variability exists in the treated population as well, uh, tremendous variability. What we think is happening is that these tablets, since they're made for people, have never been tested for bioequivalence in animals, so we can't have any assurance that they're absorbed well. And we know that Cipro is one of these drugs that relies on a, what we call a transporter in the intestine. So what happens if this human tablet that's made for a human eye tract does not absorb well? Well, what happens is, is it, theoretically, it ought to dissolve and, and be absorbed via these transporters. That's how this drug is absorbed. And that's how you get absorption. But what if the tablet is intact and it doesn't get broken down because of the differences in anatomy in a, a dog intestine versus human, and it is intact, now it bypasses that transporter. It goes, you know, essentially right past where these transporters exist, which is in the upper small intestine, and now we get pretty lousy absorption. It's not a very lipophilic drug, not as lipophilic as some of the veterinary fluoroquinolones, and absorption ends up being pretty low. We think this is what's happening. Uh, we haven't confirmed it with other studies, but we think that it is. And we think that what accounts for it, and by the way, cats have pretty lousy absorption of Cipro as well, that their intestines are very short compared to people. Uh, the human intestine is much longer, and there's much uh, longer time and a, and a bit more of an opportunity for an oral drug to be absorbed. But dog and cat intestines are quite short by comparison. So that's one thing that, you know, maybe a misconception that we need to f make sure that we understand is that human generic drugs are not the same as, as that, not assume, that we can't assume good absorption from, uh, from a human generic. The other thing that we need to look at is, and remind people of, is that compounded drugs are not generic drugs. And I know that I'm sure we could go through the exhibit hall and uh, either here or over at the Gaylord, and you could probably find some good examples of compounded products that have a nice shiny label on it, and it may, be, may even say on the label for dogs or something like that, but they're not FDA approved, and they are not generic drugs. I know sometimes they are marketed as such, or you know, people are led to believe perhaps that they are, but these are not the same. And they're, they've never been tested by the FDA. They've never been approved by the FDA. They've never undergone bioequivalent studies. In most cases, they've never even undergone stability or chemical potency studies. So one of the problems is that, remember, in a proprietary formulation, when a drug company makes a drug and gets it approved by the FDA, it's not just the raw powder that's in that product. There's fillers and excipients and inactive ingredients and things that are in there for stability and to maintain the pH at a certain range and to keep it intact. All kinds of things that companies have to go through, and, it takes, and it's very expensive and lengthy, to make that a stable product. 
and make sure that it's going to dissolve properly and so forth. When you disrupt this, or if it's uh, just a raw powder that a company puts into a capsule or packs into a tablet, uh, none of this is there, and there's never been any assurance of its absorption or potency or stability. So that's why when we disrupt this process by compounding something, uh, if it's given to a patient right away, you know, so crushing a tablet before you give it in your hospital or if an owner does that, uh, it's probably going to be okay. But when it sits on a shelf and has a long shelf life, uh, there's, there, there can be some concerns. Uh, there can be acid-base interactions, drug incompatibility. Um, Interference with stability. Oxidation is a big one. Uh, being exposed to air or water, such as when you put a drug in a suspension, in an aqueous suspension, uh, this can be a big problem. And we've looked at some of these. Uh, one example was doxycycline. Um, this is just one example from a study that we have published. We took doxycycline tablets because, you know, people crush them up and for cats, horses, even dogs uh, to cr uh, use a crush product, or they'll take even the raw powder and put that into a vehicle. And I know that they're made in lots of different ways, and I cannot I expand the results I'm going to show you to every other product that's out there. But what we did was we took the tablets, the regular tablets, crushed them up, our pharmacy did this, and used a fairly common uh, ph pharmaceutical uh, vehicle, uh, one they call Aura Plus and Aura Suite. That's used a lot by in, in many pharmacies as a vehicle for an oral suspension. And that's what we did here, and then we tested it over days. We actually re we refrigerated one formulation and put one at room temperature, and we have what we call our acceptance criteria, which is plus or minus 10 percent. And we followed this over time, at day zero, day one, day four, day, set, day seven, and what happened was this dropped off precipitously. Uh, and this, so we're measuring the potency here, and what we found is that up until day seven, it was actually okay. But after that, it went the potency, it's less than 20%. It, it just fell apart. And the observance of the, the physical appearance of it changed as well. It turned dark and kind of clumpy uh, just when we poured it out. When, and before our measurement, you know, we made sure that it was mixed well and so forth. And so this is, this is what can happen. This is what can happen from a compounded product. Now, I've had emails like crazy from compounding pharmacies saying, our product doesn't do that. Ours is better than that. Well, f my answer to them is, fine, publish it. Show us. Show us your data. This has been published in a referee journal. Um, if your compounding pharmacy has better, a better product that is more stable because of some better excipient that they use, fine, show us the data. And that's what you should do whenever you're talking to a compounding company is, is challenge them. And sometimes, they, according to the United States Pharmacopeia, an aqueous formulation should never have an, a, an expiration date beyond 14 days. But I see products out there, they put a six-month expiration date on it with no assurance. So be wary out there. Be wary. Um, and, you know, you have to worry about some of these reactions that can occur, especially when mixed with water or various vehicles, hydrolysis, oxidation reduction reactions, uh, light and actually doxycycline, as are the other tetracyclines, are incredibly light sensitive. So, but ours, these formulations that I just showed you, they were kept in the dark. They were protected from light. Here's another example. This, we, everybody knows how expensive itraconazole is. Um, each capsule is several dollars. So it's an expensive product, and I know people are trying to save money. Save money. <clears throat> but you know, when you look at this capsule, as some of you probably have, there's little beads in there. You know, there's little coated beads inside that capsule. And that, there must be a reason for that, right? It, otherwise, they would just put raw, you know, the, essentially the powder in that capsule. <clears throat> but there's little beads in there. So it must, there must be something about how this formulation is made um, to ensure its stability and all that stuff. So we decided to look at this. And this is a study that is yet, it will be published. It's been accepted <clears throat> and will be published shortly. And what we did is we looked at the regular, the brand name uh, Sporanox capsules. These, are, of course, are made for people. There's no such thing as a itraconazole approved for animals. But we took the, the proprietary Sporanox, we compared it to the generic itraconazole, and then we compared it also to the compounded version. We, they compounded a version in the pharmacy. And this is, by, this is a very unstable drug, and it's very difficult to get it absorbed even, even under the best circumstances but in a compounded form, I had doubts that it would be absorbed. And sure enough, 
this confirmed our suspicion. You see the brand, the, the uh, Sporanox form, that's in the kind of the green box here. The generic is in the yellow, and the compounded one is way down here. The absorption was almost nothing. In some dogs, it was not even measurable. So we measured the oral absorption in a set of dogs. This is nine dogs in this study. Uh, crossed them over, and oral absorption of the compounded stuff was almost negligible. And yet again, I've had compounding pharmacies email me and say, well, our stuff is better than that. You know, ours is, ours is absorbed a lot better. I said, fine, show us that data. Publish it. Convince me. <laughs> but I don't, haven't seen anything yet. So be careful. So there's lots of other examples. I won't go through each. I talked about the doxycycline, but just in published data, just in published data uh, that's been presented at meetings or published in the literature, all sorts of other drugs have, show, drugs have shown problems with stability, potency, strength, or inconsistency. Uh, omiprazole, for example, is a notorious one. Doxy I talked about. So there's all kinds of other examples. Trilostane um, is another one that pops up. Problems where compounded drugs, where they have shown through studies that compounded, that there are some problems with compounded veterinary products. And, you know, pay attention to the obvious signs that, you know, when I, if you're, you know, you can't do a chemical test every time, <clears throat> but look for color changes. Uh, precipitation, caking or swelling shows that it's probably taken on some moisture, cloudiness, droplets forming on the inside of a container. When we look at the, going back to that doxycycline study, these were both in, you know, uh, in vial or bottles that were protected from light, and, or in one of the formulations was actually kept in the refrigerator. But see that kind of dark band on there? Um, I, I should have a better close-up there, but it was, it re this was only after, you know, after seven days we saw this color change where it formed kind of a dark band. We've seen this with other products, too, where it's taking on an obvious physical change, and that should alert you. That should alert you that there's something going on. Itraconazole, we saw something similar, um, you know, kind of clumping and chunks forming at the bottom, precipitation at the bottom of the uh, container. Okay, there's another compounded situation that is done a lot, and I, this uh, particularly in cats, and we see this a lot too, and this is the, the, the stuff that is put on the skin, the transdermals, and you've, I, I'll bet, again, we could probably go into the exhibit hall and find a few companies that are making this, and essentially what they do is take the drug, mix it with some kind of a vehicle, put it on the skin, but you know what? The skin is a pretty good barrier. <laughs> you know, that's what the skin was designed to do is keep stuff out and to think that we can just mix something up in a vehicle, some magical formula, and put it on the skin and get it absorbed uh, is pretty wishful thinking. What they do then is they take these, put it in a what they call a PLO gel, and a PLO gel is a bunch of excipients and enhancers, so-called penetration enhancers, that act as uh, either emulsifiers or surfactants, and it's intended to increase penetration through the skin. And there's this acceptance there that this is going to always work, that these are going to cause things to be absorbed through the skin. And there seems to be sometimes confidence in this, but I, I'd like to caution you that this doesn't happen so easily. As I said, drugs don't get absorbed through the skin that well. The requirements to get something through the skin is that, A, it has to be very lipophilic, it has to be very potent, and then it has to meet good you know, stability and concentration characteristics to get the drug into a formulation that you can put on the skin in the first place. But I know that these are marketed. Uh, you know, I, there's one company... One compounding company, I looked on their website, and there were 21 pages, 21 pages of compounded products listed, you know, page after page after page on their website with no assurance, no assurance of their absorption. So are they really absorbed? Well, I've been looking at the literature. This might, this is, I think, not even a complete list. But I've been trying to keep track of all the studies that have either, that have confirmed by measuring blood levels that have confirmed lousy absorption. And it's getting to be a pretty long list. The most recent one was cyclosporin that was just published in the AHA journal a few weeks ago. Um, this was cyclo a transdermal cyclosporin ad administered to cats. The absorption was, gosh, it was less than 10% of the oral product. 
And so it's a pretty long list, and probably, uh, it, from my point of view, to be honest, uh, when I've been approached at, our, at, at NC State about doing additional studies on, co on compounded transdermal products for cats, my, I hate to be cynical, but I've said, what's the point? Um, unless the, you can, sh there's something that is really interesting about this, that we, and there are a couple of studies we have planned nevertheless, but I don't have much confidence in this. Now, there are a few exceptions, and actually one drug you may have noticed on this list is methimazole. In a pharmacokinetic study, they showed that methimazole really wasn't that well absorbed and was quite variable, but there have been some other exceptions. So I don't, want, I don't mean to say that this never happens. There are a couple of exceptions. Uh, two studies with methimazole in hyperthyroid cats show that it actually worked. Um, it actually, even though absorption was variable, they were, by measuring T4 levels in hyperthyroid cats, they showed that it actually was absorbed reasonably or had a therapeutic effect. And there's one study, it's a little, rather much more limited, but there were some cats in a study by Scott Helms that used amlodipine and showed by measuring blood pressure in treated cats, uh, showed that it had, did have some effect apparently in a transdermal formulation. So there might be some exceptions, but there's a lot longer list of ones that we know that aren't well absorbed. And this is another concern. This was actually uh, enrofloxacin in, uh, in the vehicle. And people generally use the PLO gels, but occasionally they'll use uh, DMSO in other vehicles also. And this is a cat that had had uh, enrofloxacin transdermal applied to its ear. And you can see what it does to the ear sometimes. So it can be quite irritating as well. So that's another concern I have with some of these products. So. We've kind of run through a couple of examples here. I've gone through some of these uh, rather quickly, but what I wanted to sh kind of just assure you of is that indeed, generic products for animals, if it is a FDA approved product, it is FDA approved, and their bioequivalence has been shown, and it is difficult criteria to meet, um, much more difficult than people realize. I, th let's put it this way, there's a lot of generic drugs that have failed because companies were not able to meet those strict criteria. Uh, but those that have, you can have some assurance that they're absorbed to the same rate and extent as the brand name product. But human generic drugs are not necessarily bioequivalent. Uh, you can't make that assumption. Maybe they are absorbed, okay, but we need more data. I showed the example of ciprofloxacin, and even with the example that I showed of the itraconazole, uh, you can't always make that assumption with human generics, uh, that they are automatically something you can transfer over to our pets. Compounded drugs are not equivalent to generics, and I hope I got that point across. And compounded transdermals, um, at least in most cases, as far as we know, are not effective. Um, they're probably nothing more than a placebo in most cases. So, well, thanks for coming. <laughs>